Hello everyone. Today we continue our series about the uh, German historiography, about the roots of Europe, the Latin Germanic uh, meeting, and the uh, broader, uh, say, frame through which, uh, in fact, historically we came to reason. Right in our nineteenth, twentieth, twenty-first century now. Um, perspective many in fact of uh, the, say, the history as a wall as a matter of fact at least if you remain concentrated in Europe but given the centrality of the West and, and the uh, archetypal meanings that are contained here definitely the uniqueness right of the old continent um, really a, a global uh, perspective in so many ways we have seen uh, in the previous long videos of this first again chunks that we uh, that I made uh, uh, throughout these days I, I thought this could be just a, a one a single video right but the more I entered in this sort of historiographical presentation the more I uh, let's say realized that there is really a lot to dig in uh, this stuff uh, because what really was believed uh, different times in history always influences the way we reason Right, even when we forget about the actual beliefs uh, of the past, right? Because even if they had never existed, right, the absence of that would be still relevant. But rather, it's the sort of subconscious uh, approach to these topics that really matters. In my opinion, we'll make multiple videos about these sort of the German. Uh, role in the uh, Renovatio Imperi and the sort of um, ethnic uh, foundations of what we consider as the European um, Empire. That was truly only one, even when we look at the Middle Ages, it's just, you know, about how it was shared and handled, right? And surely on Schwerpunkt, I began quite early to discuss these topics, but not quite. In, a, in an ethnicistic way, and or at least, of course, pointing out the sort of the ways these beliefs were twisted in a way, because it, it's not wrong to reason in ethnic terms to to a specific degree, right? And so it's not much that we shouldn't actually emphasize that, or we should. This is a channel says, well, should be balanced. We should be a sort of dilution of all the these meanings to not to, to, to sound I don't know racist or whatever that's not the goal the goal is to understand exactly what role all these factors really had but in in this sense also how intertwined they really are because the entire point of the empire is actually the transfiguration of humanity into uh, the one into the truth and so the even the ethnic dimension takes up a specific role, right, uh, into it, because we that really achieved what, historically? Who, who were the Romans? Who were the Germans? Uh, and more, right? And as a medievalist, of course, it's, I think, always refreshing to look at the, the various historiographical branches, also the least... Um, sort of famous ones, uh, this is not properly a, um, let's say, a historiography video, but it's a sort of introduction to the point um, of why, of course, we we reason through concepts that sh surely have been already expressed, and so we mostly echo at a point, but we don't necessarily understand the, the roots uh, anymore. In the previous part, um, the second part of, of this video, we, uh, I mean, uh, say, this video understood as a wall, right, and not divided into various parts, we observed, for example, the paradox of how the Germanic primitive uh, communism, uh, were the, the Mark Genossenschaft, was expressed by actually right-wingers and was eventually adopted by the same Marx and Engels to explain, uh, say, you see, it's the same concept, right, but different political groups used it to e even supporting it as an interpretative category but with to different ends right it, they were both praising this communitarian um, life right but two different ends and that, that is much to say how 
you can't really look at the same historical um, topic and not saying, well, this was, say, um, something I believe in one way or I believe in the opposite. And so that's basically where the the, the problem ends, right? right? What we call right or left uh, politically very often is very mixed in the very... Um, um, especially in the extremes, as a matter of fact. But you can argue also in, in the center, of course, there is a lot of meeting ground. So the question is, is that sort of horizontal space, uh, left and right, uh, really the, uh, the horizontal dimension, really the, the only one? Or is there multiple one? There is also a sort of vertical one that is the one uh, to which, uh, along which tradition develops. Right, I think that's actually the the actual the actual answer, and of course it's never an easy um, topic, right? You know, that I have the habit of sort of digressing on it. I will try to avoid to do it for this video because um, nothing seems so so linear after all, right? There is a limit in the way we, of course, can't grasp the truth in a in a satisfactory manner that, in fact, prevents us to understand how many layers there are here to surpass. And that's, I think, the single most difficult um, challenge that I had when making these YouTube videos um, since the beginning, because um, you come across, let's say, um, you're listened to by many people that have sort of different ideas, yes, but they are also ideas that you start understanding being ingrained into some other reality, right? There are some, I'd say, some ways I address uh, these topics that, of course, are modeled on the base of my YouTuber experience that I would have never known, even as a, as a historian uh, out there. Uh, and of course, that's why I'm very interested in the demographics, in the origin, etc., of my followers. Not because I'm, you know, making, I'm flattering them for wherever they come from, which is something that sometimes they believe I do. I mean, I'm glad, you know, when when I make history, if somebody comes from the same place where, you know, the, the country I'm discussing, that, yeah, I understand why it can be positive if they like, of course, what I say, but mostly because. Uh, yes, there is a sense of community after all, but I don't do it because um, the point is okay. Well, now we'll uh, wait for the the team that sort of uh, we wait uh, the flag of, and then everything is sort of you know get boiling down to that. That's not actually what the channel is about because we take an imperial and universal perspective here, not just the traditional or divine one, if that uh, was, because uh, that also is susceptible to very strange declinations. But we have seen, regarding the Germanic primitive communism, or whatever this was, of course it never existed, right? It's not less utopian as an idea than the same Marxian theory, for example. We explained what that really meant, what they were really... Um, particularly unstratified society, simply because they didn't have enough surplus to to establish um, uh, a greater hierarchy. But at the same time, of course, they were clientary systems, um, like all pre-industrial societies with, with, a, with an aristocracy. And the fact that the majority of freemen at some point were, um, you know, fundamentally really free, but not because that was... That, in fact, that didn't mean exactly that they were in a better condition, would have been in absolute terms in, in other different times. So, say, freedom is a good thing when you actually have the capacity of wielding that freedom uh, through your own same power, right? In other words, the only way to be free is to be God, right? And for the others... There is just liberty, right? There are some things that you can do on your own. And there are some things that you can't do, or at least you, you could do, because everything is always possible, but you're limited. 
uh, because your forces are not enough to compare with one of the others and this is because the world is fallen and so sort of spread right um, out there and there are lots of other people who are not just a one on let's say absolute infinite reality and so we have to cope true liberty with our fallen condition and so with our sins and with um, the um, you know the sense that of course we all have a responsibility that goes far beyond just sitting there in a pretty uh, say also depressed uh, situation and pretending that since we are allegedly free which was in fact also the, the utopia of this world um, right that, that that would be a positive thing and that, that you understand how both right or left wing can hijack this right I'm I'm right wing as you know but um, say I'm right wing in a beyond extreme way to the point that I skip most uh, political um, frames including as you know to, to me national socialism is, is leftism fundamentally so it's just <laughs> that, that basically the standard but again there are different dimensions so at some point if you understand what I established as traditionalism fundamentally as the basis of this content what that basically gets down to. Now, it's obvious that from the 19th century, um, these theories, say, about the the, the aforementioned um, Mark-Genossenschaft were passed, right, were surpassed, to say the least, right, because we realized that these things simply did not exist. They, as as we have say, uh, seen yesterday, they essentially had patched this together, basing themselves on Tacitus' sort of um, romantic, traditional, good, good, savage um, view of the Germans from you know the the ultra senatorial elite of Rome for this sort of ancestral connections that were important. This is not to say that the Germans weren't actually. It's that, that, I don't know Tacitus. The origin at C to Germanorum actually does not represent to an important degree of accuracy what, uh, in fact, Germany was at the time. Lots of people, say, complain about, I don't know, Tacitus was just, uh, again, part of those senators that did not want, in order to maintain their, their privilege, to share, uh, the, in fact, their, their, the empire with... Um, yet another um, Romanized barbarian aristocracy, so the one in Germany, and that's the reason why and I never made, I think, a, a video specifically on that, but the sense that um, so there is a huge debate on whether Germany should have been conquered or not, and it became sort of pivotal in the moment in which, of course, 19th century Germans began to reactivate, becoming uh, um, a great power and um, sort of bringing on the fore again the potential of Germany when this you know had um, what was unified at least in that context which had never been uh, technically and so whenever this spirit right this sort of ethnos this this culture in spite of changes right and development uh, over time was Yes, and I don't think it, there is nothing bad to say that was essentially the continuation of, of that ancestral world. Surely very transformed and whatever. But believe me, uh, over time, I say that the more you study history, this is in my experience, and the more you realize, especially when you get really into the depths and the, and so the, the, the differences of different peoples, um, the characteristics of these populations, that... Um, you know, that character you see in them is truly uh, much more continuous from the past than um, than we're usually told, right? Uh, this is not necessarily even about the continuity with the same people, right? There are lots of people from migration era that moved from Germany and went somewhere else, right? And so you can't quite count them, if not in other countries, aside from certain groups that had remained from the original one there. And so it's obvious that things changed. A part of Germany was, I don't know, Slavicized. Uh, uh, also, Germany itself expanded into 
the romano celtic world to an important degree um so that's how much the the country changed and even just modern contemporary ba- borders did change after all um and if you wonder why i make so many videos uh, about uh, you know so many videos in general right but also and especially about these things um you understand how important it is to in fact bring people to realize that in spite of these differences you can always find some important cultural continuity which has nothing to do as you understand from these very videos that are essentially a criticism of uh, nationalism and of course socialism and communism but nationalism in this case as an anti-traditional ideology because nations do have a role in tradition but uh, not nationalism which is a very 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 different thing right uh, if you especially get proper about the definition and the fact that again nationalism is not just it, i know i'm aware i'm speaking mostly to an american audience and and the impression i get uh, in general not much from you uh, as my followers but from my follow political commentaries and so on that that of course there is a level of say categorization that is proper of the United States that surely developed with necessary care towards the various sort of political, uh, national, uh, religious, ethnic divides in the communities within the, the same United States. And so at some point uh, had sort of an easier way of categorizing, right? And so... Um, it's uh, it's easier to say, well, but nationalism, you know, even after all, it's just a term, right? It's just because you love your nation, you want it to, to, to grow prosper. So what's wrong with that? You want to maintain sort of an ethnic homogeneity because it's, you know, it's objectively more useful for political cohesion and working, uh, et, et cetera, to some degree. Yes, but you have to understand that nationalism is a very specific thing historically, Right in times and places where very big things happen. I'm not just talking. I don't know. Obviously, you know this this topic about German nationalism gets boiled, so it gets down to for most people just national socialism, the Second World War, the Holocaust, and so on. But the the the, the problem actually, and the, the most interesting thing in my, in many ways, according to me, is the the before. Right after all, national socialism in power lasted just 12 years right and just compared to i don't know uh to the last couple of centuries of course of german history and w- in what role did nationalism play in that regard well it's a it's a hell of a it's a hell of a topic you know i have von clausewitz um we'll talk about scharnhorst we'll talk about many figures that did use the nation and in the unification of germany in the development of so many also strategic thinking that was in part also misused both during world war the first and world war the second that actually has a good root but was in fact hijacked misused misunderstood and this is a an issue that you can't quite ignore um also in explaining for example the german defeats in both world wars uh, etc. Um, so um, we've seen how this sort of German, if you want, we do not want to call them communism, but uh, we'll say communitarism, and be aware of how tricky these things really are, right? Uh, communitarism, multiculturalism, apparently being opposite, but still they do overlap to some to some degree. Uh, because you you must give say in front of the extreme what actually happens in a real society and so there as a historical model right is it something you, you must define uh, at, at every step of the way when looking at specific examples but as we've seen that the concept being that the germans were just about sort of the spiritual preparation the fact that they um didn't that they 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 were about war fundamentally they they as warlike tribes in fact they looted and so on and so that was apparently all nice and fine until they migrated into the uh, 
and the Roman world that had the, 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 the Latifundium and so began the terrible corruption of the originary, uh, originary spirit of Germanism. Right? Now, the problem with this interpretation is not much, even in this case, what the dynamic, which in a sense is valid, right? is a valid category interpretation. The problem is how much also you do not see, um, how much power they were able to wield uh, in, the, in the different spaces of this, because definitely Germany didn't remain a better place, or was never up to, up, up to that point a, a better place to live in than, say, Gaul um, or Italy. But, um, so there is also this, this aspect which doesn't necessarily mean to support, well, they were simply richer. It, it was also a matter of who did keep, for example, up with the, um, say, why the Germans went there in the first place and why did they resume the empire that became, in fact, a Holy Roman thing from the heart of, of Germany and from Germans that decided from Germany to um, to take on the to take up this um this responsibility and so you have to explain there why romanity and why so also um see this this idea of course uh pays for the, the idea that Ro say the romans always had a lot of fundium right so they had a lot of fundium when they had b before the peak of their empire they had a lot of fundium after the peak of their empire um and definitely their empire was the greatest thing that ever happened um Surely in Europe, you can uh, actually easily and easily say in the world, uh, and we know that the Germans did not achieve that later on. And so given that they were actually into that same imperial cult and made lots of videos themselves, and not just in later times, but literally when they served as war banders uh, in the uh, in the Roman armies and were partaking that sort of imperial chance of redemption and you know in exchange for duty and holy sacrifice in, in, in combat and so on. That was the same thing they did at home, by the way. That's why they were hired by the Romans. Well, you realize that there is much more than that, right? And, and of course, 19th century, Germany was aware of this to an important degree, right? Um, there were, let's say, an interesting video in the future would be the divide between those who believed just in a purely Germanistic sort of superiority, and those who instead said, well, look, that fundamentally when we look at Europe and when we look at even at the traditional view, you cannot quite have a true success if you do not mix the Apollonian, say, if you do not combine the Apollonian with the Dionysian, because they both have a role in the same reawakening of divine power. And the Germans, actually from the same, from the same Tacitus and Caesar, etc., were credited with this, right? The, the their sort of, um, uh, in fact, uh, shamanic trances, the sort of the, the, the rites of in, in initiation, etc. There were those, let's say, features that today we would call of barbarism. That, however, the Romans that didn't intend the term barbarian as the Greeks did, um, and were much more interested in peoples like the the Germans, the Gauls, etc for this originally primitive sort of unspoiled, in fact, ideas. It's not a 19th century invention, right? It was the literal Romans that believed that and that were interested in it. Otherwise, this thing would have not emerged. In fact, it did um, provide with the evidence that at this point you have different peoples that are different stages in their history, um, and that, of course, are stages that do not quite overlap again by themselves, because there was never such a thing like, you know, the equivalent of the Roman Empire, even when the Germans had their own empire, right? And this also is to contextualize in a millenary history of human fall in the generations in different spiritual ages, right? The Holy Roman emperors were Christian emperors, for example, and uh, even about Christianity, most people are really confused. They, the, the, the harshest sort of Germanists are mostly paganists or neo-paganists uh, because they do not concretely understand what Catholicism meant also in the pagan world. Um, and they would say, well, no, it's, you know, just like, I don't know, National Socialism. Basically, Christianity is just a sort of um, offspring of Jewish and therefore of uh, negative Right. 
uh, culture, etc. So uh, we have to upgrade the system from that. That's literally what the Nazi leaders believed. In that. And 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 the, aside from the um, let's say the, the 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 example that I often say, right? I could easily say that you know anti-Semitism is one of the indicators of the main indicators of the cultural inferiority of people, right? But the it's better to phrase it for for these people like more like uh, you know if you are the allegedly the the master race why are you allegedly enslaved by another one and why that one should be inferior to you when you're actually under them right because the entire tradition in the same time of the of the germans of the romans let's say in ancient times was exactly this. So you're part of the reason why, in fact, the same national socialism failed in many ways was founded on this, like on destruction rather than transfiguration. Right? They they could have even you know achieved um, way more if they hadn't even just decided that many potential auxiliaries, let's say, especially in the East, were just an inferior race. Talking about the Slavs. Um, and and that was an enormous deal when fighting against the Soviet Union, but that's the problem, right? It's as if you know, ah, if the Nazis hadn't been like that, but the problem is that is exactly that the Nazis were exactly that historically. So you can't quite. I don't. I don't like what ifs. I don't like sort of. Uh, oh, what would have happened if you know? One thing is to sort of see the immediate aftermath of a situation and assessing what chances were there for things to go differently and even with that you would have a, a methodological problem but when the thing is literally inventing that something had to go for no reason whatsoever um, on any historical ground uh, even by li- say by by modest uh, say by by likelihood uh, in a certain way what's the point of in the historical exercise of that right it's not history that's fiction, right? Um, uh, as we were saying in the previous videos, in spite of all these issues, um, it's undeniable that there were some positive effects in this tendency uh, to rediscover the German roots. Remember that historically, as we've seen, Yes, there had been a sort of obsession with classics because essentially Greece and Rome had embodied historically the most Apollonian um, and in fact most successful civilizations of the past. And so, say, barbarians had fit um, mostly... I mean, barbarians were all those that the Greeks and the Romans thought of being barbarians. Um, And, of course, the barbarian there is not how the 19th century would sort of load it in, in emphasis and in meaning, even with the Kaiser before World War I actually claiming the Germans to be Huns, exactly, to be that ferocious and hated, while, you know, some 21st century modern thinks that it's just terrible, I don't know, allied propaganda, right? You know, the, the reason, that, that's one of the single most intimate meanings of, in that sense, even German, Germanic tradition, meaning that the Huns, as you know, had 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 even reinvigorated with other peoples the sort of Dionysian element into the reawakening of the strength of war bands had sort of uh, autocraticized the um, the Germanic tribes that they had developed into, into something more from confederacies to, to monarchies. Well, the latter were actually created by the Romans, but still under these pressures, right, from uh, these other peoples were reinjecting, right, but together with all the Iranian uh, refugees, etc., those tri- warlike Dionysian element had to be reawakened in order to be tamed by the Apollonian element so that you could attain transfiguration of those same Dionysian forces and simply flying to the sky, right? Uh, like in in the apotheosis. Well, um, the, the, um, the, 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 the were, for example, let's cut the chase here, the, the some... Uh, themes, some topics of ethno-anthropological kind while the studying of the past um, abounded right, also towards the sort of universalistic and generalizing tendencies uh, but 
still adopting also, as we've seen, the national perspectives, right? Uh, the tension here is extremely relevant, as we've seen nations in terms of political guidance and even an institutional formality emerged historically uh, at the decline of universal powers, right? And the interesting thing about German history is that you have a very dual phase here, because again, the the exasperated ethno supremacist or whatever would say, "Well, yes, I know what you're talking about. It's the Romans, these terrible universalists or multiculturalists." Of course, there was the Roman Empire was nothing multiculturalist actually, as we intended, but projecting that, you know, and so the Germans actually rose. And that fits with our national history, right? Or with, I don't know, the later pro the Reformation, give aside that half of Germany remained Catholic, etc. This kind of things, right? Uh, oh my God, there are people now who really hate me among my... <laughs> I hope that there is no uh, Protestant Northern German here that, that hates me now. But um, but there was some good in that too. Like I have some video in store and, and explain why, because there is always a, a, a dual phase. Here we are talking about something different. It was the, the the Germans that adopted the Holy Roman title and that were actually the first ones to clamorously suffer from the collapse of universal authorities because they were, let's say, if we want to call it approximately a, a German-led empire, um, the ones to crumble, right? They want to see, together with the papacy, through the shrinking towards the late Middle Ages. We made multiple videos about that, right? So the failure of the great unification, the great universal rule, right? Europe, Mediterranean, so everything there, uh, the continent, Rome, um, Constantinople, the Holy Land, etc. Well, that failed in the 13th century, and uh, there is no doubt that the same 19th century German nationalism, uh, even when sort of you know, uh, blaming, in fact, the Hohenstaufen or other, or the Salians or, or the Ottonians, etc., for, for chasing the famous Mediterranean chimera and pretended to just, in fact, the north, because in the 19th century it was mostly about the Baltic, the, not only, but at least the North Sea, etc., but mostly the east, right? So the, what southern Germans, in fact, in Hohenstaufen times were not, necessarily going particularly because they had mostly Italy to try to hegemonize in that regard. They were looking in fact at the latter and saying, well, but you know, at least we got it. Huh? It was it was our in fact, as as the later dissitor literally said, or recitated, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. But at that point was not a thing uh yet. Uh but it, it's interesting that in that same thirteenth century when um, from the Steirische uh, Rhein Konig, um, when um, written by the son of a ministerialis, right, and some of this man ha having been in, in the Battle of Markfeld, right, you would find in, in the latter the German knights that used as a battle cry, here is Rome, right, a, a purely central European battle, the largest for number of knights likely in the entire feudal uh, warfare. Um, between the Germans, uh, supported by the Hungarians and the Bohemians, and partly the Poles, and other Germans, by the way, they were hired as mercenaries. Um, so hardly anything Romance around. But the Germans called themselves Romans, ethnically speaking. This is not to say that they didn't know they were speaking Germans, they were Germans, of course. But it's incredibly important. It's, it's a bit like the later, say, what had happened during the migration era, which was made a video that uh, the the Gallo-Romans, the, the, the Romano-Italics, uh, the, 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 the Hispano-Romans began to call themselves the Franks, the Burgundians, the gods, the Longobards, um, even though they, even the, those guys who had, say, just mated with people of, of Germanic descent, um, uh, and so they were at least largely coming from Central Europe uh, down um, genealogically, were speaking Roman, were legislating in Latin, and were eventually to remain there to become part of those local nations. So this cannot be, of course, uh, avoided. 
as a theme of general interest uh, when discussing this, right? Especially for the 19th century where you do find a lot of sort of comparison in this sort of national sense, right? The 19th century was this moment of great sort of scales, ladders, measurements, hierarchies, competitions, with, I don't know, the tallest people, the ones that had the strongest army, and there was all this, this, this industrial military competition, etc. And historians, generally speaking, did, after all, recognize um, this sort of European exclusiveness, after all, over the rest of the world, that still included more or less the entire, um, the entire, say, ethnic um, composition of the continent. Right, so again, we, we've said yesterday, like Latin culture could not be uh, bypassed, right? Um, say in the same Germanic history, like the the entire development of states of Christianization, so it passed throughout for, for centuries and centuries, like essentially an emanation of culture of civilization from from southern Europe, and especially in that continuous outpour from the Roman world properly meant, right? So um, there were different racialistic issues because Germany was also mostly interested in the, say, for political and strategic reasons in the, uh, in, 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 the cent in Central Europe, right? And in, so the options mostly in the West and East rather than South. Um, and so, as we will see now, this would take uh, also specific historiographical directions and so think about the the French German fuss about Charlemagne's national identity uh, etc um, but there was definitely a lot about for example ethnoanthropology that as we've seen began to ask questions say, what do we mean by peoples what do we mean by this it's a very political uh, rather than just historical question but it forces you morally and scientifically to give to provide with an answer so from from one side you had a sort of imperial world domination considering that crushing uh, say a, a major european country would have meant to crush also a colonial empire right uh, and so the possibility of playing literally at war domination at some point, uh, but also remaining limited after all, as we remain to to this point to a to a national order, right? Internationally, you may have a greater power, uh, like the United States after World War II, um, but never like the equivalent, again, of a universal, a, a true universal domination, especially intended in the traditional and divine way. Because these are the same generations that were fundamentally starting to abandon uh, even the, the truest meanings, uh, that up to that point, even in some sort of um, even superstitious form, had, after all, held, uh, stood their ground. Uh, and when nationhood came at the center of historical interest, lots of sort of details about various countries began to emerge in a more consistent way, right? So, for example, uh, the, uh, the proper awareness of a Celtic, Slavic, or Germanic uh, dimension uh, of historical studies, etc., it truly emerged at this point. Because before, it had legitimately been Greece and Rome that had never needed uh, a presentation right, of some sort, and that, in fact, all these historiographies were still recognizing, and in part, of course, pointing out the, the sort of common European ancestry, at least in the Indo-European cultural hegemonization of the continent, and so on. But all the various, sometimes even national struggles, right, struggles for independence, for unification, etc., did bring lots of other countries focusing more on both their nation and also the, the broader ethnos. Think about all the pan-Germanistic, the pan-Slavistic ideas uh, that never, however, meant, especially, uh, let's say, the, the latter in this case, uh, I mean, the pan-Germanistic, pan-Slavistic ever meeting the 
the actual universal dimension that they were aiming at also because there would have been always a single nation would have liked to hegemonize that namely uh, Germany Russia right with other people saying well nuts to that um, uh, but the sense for example and this stemmed also for from consistent inferiority complexes sometimes that for the first time the Celts, the Slavs, the Germans had to be understood as a civilization all pair with the Greek and the Roman one with something emerging right and naturally that also brought its own historical forcing ideological sort of um, emphasis etc uh, because what does civilization mean right you want to point out as some people still do today in fact this, this, these are ideologies spreading also with mass society and were used fundamentally to to render people more obedient um, say the even just the demographic ratios of which peoples lived at a given time they're, they're bypassed right there are the way pop culture has absorbed um, the middle ages is of course a more sort of germanic uh, influenced sort of vibe generally speaking than 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 else or even mo mostly actually british uh, if we really want to be specific that is not entirely uh, germanic either but that's the point right uh who does really care in pop culture about the bulgarian middle ages let's be honest like the, all the things you really look at it's um it's a because that's where also money comes from it's so it's essentially an anglo uh, anglo spheral fundamentally uh, dimension already France starts being too well you know yeah they were the kind of guys from the other side and uh, they're relevant because we interacted with those right you know but it's not that we care too much about that it's, it's mostly for con assert that this is um, going to be um, there were also other historiographical branches sort of that emerged for example the ones about daily life, work, right? There were socialists, of course, bringing their own thing on the fore, or, um, you know, the coexistence between men, the, as we've seen with Marx in theories, all this materialistic, deterministic uh, nonsense that just only flipped the, the idealistic philosophies and just tried to go by that without understanding that the sin that they committed in that um, there is uh, for example Maitzen's work that exemplify a, a bit the spirit of classification that a bit was uh, inherited by the enlightenment from the enlightenment but uh, was now loaded with this positivistic bragging boasting sort of um, you know ultra nationalization of its own tag its own recognition uh, on in the form of fields say of uh, for example the the literal fields um the agricultural ones typical of every single people that is to say well i don't know that the germans had this type of land set landed settlement the the slavs this other one etc these are of course they were done with the means of the time, they were not even that bad, telling the truth. But of course, today they are quite uh, outdated, to say the least, because just so much evidence came around that those sort of uh, frames are just not able to contain it. Um, right? This is not to say that some general ideas are aren't still important to to use sometimes, but um, we went beyond in terms of what is that we want to know specifically also about this and, and just there is so much right now that if you want to really build an, a general awareness about one people one sort of uh say just uh, topics like this like what kind of shape that fields have at some point well you can easily read so much that you will be given a general if you do if you do read that you will be given a general outlook on the on the picture um the 
idea that came around at that point was that every element of human history could have different manifestations depending on the the context of civilization in which this uh, realizes itself right um, this is in many ways the, the great contribution that German medievistics especially at the end of the 19th century provided to historiographical development they were saying well look there were also us, right? There were also the Germans. There were also this very... Um, we don't, in fact, every people, of course, is, is peculiar in different ways. But considering the role that Germans had had, right? The area of Germany, also in the past in which this was not really even in, intended by the local inhabitants as something political, um, um, the... The, the role that it had had during the Roman Empire, having been tr in the true center of Europe, also in between modernity and tradition, Western Europe, Central Europe, Northern Europe, and Southern Europe, right? So, um, a truly unique country that doesn't find equals, and that was, especially in the 19th century, big and powerful enough to definitely interest in its history uh, all around. Um, Lamprecht and the Kulturgeschichte anticipated under many aspects, however, this categorization, the famous experience in the 20th century of the French journal uh, Annal, as Annal, that um, likely would have been like uh, appreciated by the same Marc Bloch. This should make you understand how close, after all, was nationalism to socialism, how I will explain in the other video, like the idea that you're basically relevant just because you have a citizenship, um, even though, of course, every country was also importantly mixed in that regard, but this forced homogenization, well, has, again, as a consequence, the only landing, uh, possible landing field of claiming something for you just as being part of this community. And it becomes socialism, right? hence also national socialism, and the precise idea of the same, right? Uh, in, in that sense, uh, aside from the ideologism of the leaders that were much more occultistic and exoteric and sort of, you know, spiritual and religious even, it's obvious that you couldn't lead a um, 20th century great power into a totalitarian war, um, you know, with, with that history, with that past, by not inserting both nationalism and socialism conceptually in a communitarian way in the in the equation, right? That's the reason why the Nazis say that the leaders were fundamentally not sympathetic towards Christianity at all. But of course, it was they were being con considerably endorsed by by Christianity. There were other groups of uh, Christian Nazis, etc. But there was always this sort of um, ambiguity for which, yes, you 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 stress like you you base your entire um, political doctrine on the necessity of purity, etc. But so why do you come? Why, why do you come to compromise eventually if these ideas are so should be so successful at winning um, with these ideologies that you loathe, right? Because they could have not governed. Otherwise, and that's the actual point. And even if this had been allegedly been a fault of, of the people, which surely in its fourth estate mass society dimension, of course, was like just a definitely not um, uh, to the standards of the, the alleged master race, then in fact they were boasting themselves for essentially eliciting just the, the lowest forces of you know humanity. Um, the that this entire thing would have not gone. This is not to say that, of course, the Nazis would, didn't come close to, that didn't achieve a hell of a power at some point. But how much did it last anyway? And you know, wasn't it doomed since the beginning, in many ways, uh, as we're pointing out before. Um, so, what did happen when, specifically when? Uh, so we've seen the Germans start studying like other peoples, mostly their own nation, right? Uh, remaining still within this Western awareness of, of course, the entire history of, of the 
of Europe and how this had happened. So they couldn't quite bypass the Latin Germanic meeting, which was, uh, of course, a uh, say the entire point, if you want, to the same German Empire, right? Not just these were calling themselves Roman emperors, but they were doing so because, of course, the center of the world had remained Rome anyway as the holy city. Uh, and they required specifically the election of, from the by, by the Romans, right, um, in order to be recognized as leaders, as Roman emperors, even of German nation. Um, the point there was mostly stressing uh, from their side that the Germans would have been a sort of winning culture that would have built Europe. Right or at least um, you can say the Germanic peoples and or, however, the idea of a sort of revanchism over the Romans, like saying uh, they called us barbarians, but at the end of the day we were the ones who won. Right now, I made enough vi migration era videos to explain how uh, what I was saying before that yes, the the Romano-Germanic kingdoms were surely such because. Um, tens or uh, hundreds of thousands of um, Germanic peoples broadly meant marched uh, individually on different uh, Romance countries and fundamentally uh, substituted themselves to the local Roman military and eventually they settled down in a couple of generations they were fundamentally becoming part of that kingdom, right, and that was um, prevalently um, uh, romance, right, the only exception in that, at least for how culture eventually took over, is Britain, right, where more or less it remained a Germanic country, right, um, and that became, in fact, uh, except that romance themselves began to speak romance and to be just ruling from those places that were actually the most advanced in Europe anyway, right, so that when the migration era was over. Uh, Germany was in part emptied, but not, let's not exaggerate about the, the degree of that, just other peoples, such as the Slavs especially, began to fill the gaps in the eastern part that was sort of the, le the least developed. Um, but definitely again, when you look at the, the, the biggest powers in Western Europe, they were these Romano-Germanic kingdoms that fundamentally were Romance kingdoms, and Central Europe was not really a, much of a great place were to be, without mentioning that this central Europe would have been eventually taken over by the Carolingians, completely Christianized under the Roman Pope, and still, yes, led by dynasts that were Germanic, and speaking Germanic, until the 10th century, uh, but that um, still were mostly based also on a, you know, uh, and centered, actually, in fact, as power and sort of clientels, etc., in, in Romance lands. And there is also the question, of course, of how the Germans had initially sort of uh, distinguished themselves from the locals as rulers, because they were the, the former were proper free men, and the others were... And there is a huge uh, debate on this, because there is, we do not actually have the evidence of, let's say, a Roman... Uh, let's say, subjection in a practical sense, right? Juridically, you, you do find that, of course, you had to be a German eventually to be a free man, but you understand that in this legal code, fundamentally, everybody became a German juridically, of, of the inhabitants locally, and still, of course, that the, the, the same Germanic aristocracies were taking over, over the same Germanic freemen that began that became assimilated socially also to, to the to the romance, it's still that there were powerful, look at the Pippin and Arnold things, uh, marriages um, between essentially Ro Roman, Romanized population and the same Germanic chieftains. And this was so self-evident in the, say, the medieval history that had already been studied in Britain that there couldn't quite be just a separatistic, you know, mentality for which it could simply be thought that um, 
doesn't matter how important the Germanic peoples had been in moving to that direction and to be kept to, to rebuild Europe right together with the Latins but still with this sort of more primitive um, spiritual force that was not yet exhausted or spoiled it, that sort of re, re, replenished that the ones that these, these other also Mediterranean peoples had had uh, from from the, the, the European migration times um, it r required necessarily the term mitigation in fact nobody like you know that this um, I, I'm not making this video because of the, the recent one I made on Nordicism and mantra and all that stuff but it's very important to stress also for looking and keeping this in mind when you look at today's extremism in some fields and sort of the this sort of true cancelling of a part of culture as a relevant one for European integrity that very often is in fact at the top of um, so it's based fundamentally on racial discrimination in a biological, in, in a mostly just in a physical sense. Sometimes there is a sort of paradoxically of Cartesian, almost in fact, uh, Cather reemergence in certain um, sort of neo, uh, not even neo Nazis, because they are, again they have very strong socialistic features. In fact, uh, as such, but um, but the fact that um, in fact, you couldn't quite eliminate Latin history from the picture. You had to had a an argument for providing the the most objective information. And nobody say, uh, even though there were those scholars that tended to just say, no, we were just the Germans. We are the best ones. The other was our mistake. The Romans were corrupted and evil and uh, in fear and whatever. But no serious scholar at the time, even in the strongest temper of um, the, the nationalist um, ideologies of still of the of the last great empires in Europe and so on um, were not emerging right everybody knew that the Middle Ages had been um, something more say dialectical at least culturally speaking right the most, however, uh, e say extreme direction that would have that Ger Germanic or German nationalism would have taken would have been the following: with simple steps. That is to say, first of all, Europe would have been formed as such progressively during the Middle Ages. Now, this is a big statement because while it is true that a European awareness was something that was constructed throughout the the Middle Ages in a in the way we could still adopt and it was not even formed properly at that time. It's hardly to be um seen in this regard as the merit of just one people. Right? Let's let's leave aside that say the way especially modern and Western Europe were defined uh, historically, it's it's uh, li even leaving chunks of Europe almost out, right? You know, as a sort of this, they're barely European. Um, it, it's something that happens with the Ottoman invasions, right? With with the Ottoman invasion, you have a neat affirmation of what Western Europe actually means, and you have also a better definition of what Southern Europe is, what Central Europe is, uh, which was not entirely there even during the Middle Ages. Right, but if anything, the the Middle Ages see the emergence of powers such as even I don't know the Slavic ones. Think about Poland, right? That hardly can be seen there as a sort of German creation uh, or something springing, in fact, from a country that would have would have was at least Germanized at some point. Poland was Germanized. Don't get me wrong, but I mean that they had it had never been ruled by a a Germanic establishment as Poland. Right, differently from again, uh, France, um, uh, Italy, right, Spain, etc. Uh, the other concept was that the Middle Ages would have been essentially Germanic, right? This is, of course, even more controversial as an idea because even if again the the Germans did spread uh, pretty much across the entire. 
continent, again, the way they w say the, the consequences of this were very different, right? You have, again, these more developed countries in southwestern Europe that fundamentally maintain the primacy even in development until basically the, throughout the entire Middle Ages, politically, military, socially. Germany, yes, does consolidate also as a, as a country on its own, but it fails as a national monarchy uh, and gets particularly fragmented. Um, um, even with chunks within the empire that were technically more cohesive, such as Bohemia, for example, right? Um, even for Slavic Europe, uh, you could argue, well, yes, there was a Germanic colonization within them, but you cannot deny there that still they were essentially Slavic powers, right? Um, there is a Celtic fringe, there are lots of things going on. Um, so the idea behind an essentially Germanic Middle Ages seems rather the fact that the Germans had, uh, as we were saying before, injected a dramatic level of you know, spiritual, primitive, sort of genuine, primigenial uh, force into an exhausted Latin world. And so that this re-fertilized, re -re revived and restrengthened the, the same, the same Latin world in the process with this German element. Um, many um, scholars began to think that uh, Europe would have mostly in Germany, of course, the Europe would have been an essentially Germanic construction. This is, uh, this is important. Uh, of course, you, you understand there, the problem with, say, in Germany compared to, say, Scandinavia, right, that these things were not entirely new as ideas. Just think about during the, uh, I don't know, the, the confessional wars when uh, the Spain and Sweden were fighting in the same Germany during the Thirty Years' War, and um, they, like, they, they were literally quarreling over, let's say, uh, whom uh, had really uh, the the truest Gothic legacy, because the Swedes simply said, "Well, we even have uh, traditionally as uh, the title our kings, like King of the Gods, etc." That there is there are lots of different uh say of course of um uh, of course of remains of that i also made a video about the geet by the way but the spanish said well but we had the actual true visigoths that went on conquering the Iberian peninsula and that were not idlers in scandinavia and they had this sort of bizarre ideas because of course they um there, there were, again, let's not digress again in Nordicism, but the idea that, of course, the German rulers had somehow been the standard, right? At least the, all over Southern Europe, you do find essentially ruling families of Germanic ancestry that cared even about their physical characteristics, their their phenotypes, etc., to, to say, well, we are the race of northerners, basically, that won and arrived. This is something that, as we've seen, the same Romans believed when they were conquering Egypt of, or Carthage or even Greece, right? They they felt that they were truly the northern force that was coming to rapaciously seize this sort of um, weak, um, feminine south, right? It's the same idea, and this is not invented in the 19th century. It was revived strongly in the 19th century with very sort of um, marked, um, uh, let's say, uh, stereotyping and references to this sort of ethnic racial differences, because it was the center of, of racism, basically, uh, in a scientific sense. Uh, that was also an Enlightenment thing, that was good, but not because never make the mistake of thinking that before that there wasn't ra uh, say a racial, ferocious racial discrimination that did exist in the ancient world as hell, right? As much as also um, during the Middle Ages to some degree. At least it, it was understood that ethnic differences were really important, except that these were understood mostly in a social sense rather than in a simply pop, say, national sense, even though there had been these various peoples that had definitely made the great, like uh, the Italics, the um, 
the, the first the, the, the Macedons, the then the Germans, etc. So there was this understanding that some people had, after all, got it uh, for others to be the losers, right, and the former to be the winners. Um, in other words, the German 19th century was sort of reacting um, towards the Latin cultures. For example, the Italian one. Uh, this was easy because, of course, Italy was had been the center of Rome, of Romanity, of Latin culture proper. So, um, the there was an obvious dichotomy revolving around that, right? Rome that had fallen after all, but still had been kept alive by the same Germans because they had been elected as the next people to hold the empire, uh, etc. Um, the same Italian nationalism, for example, was, uh, and one of, this was true in part also in France, etc., was looking instead in a classicistic way to the fact that if anything good had existed during the Middle Ages, this had been thanks to the difficult survival of elements of Roman culture, right? Uh, the French had a different, a slightly different um, focus because they had had an imperial experience, right? Always remember that also during the Middle Ages, especially after the fall of uh, of the Hohenstaufen, and it's really France that basically takes the place of the empire quite consistently. Uh, but there, there was this thing of Charlemagne in the first place that was enormous uh, because... It is true that the Franks fundamentally had based their own power. I made mean, just a video recently um, on would have, what would have been North Eastern France, Belgium, right? Uh, speaking in contemporary terms, um, so yes, the, the Carolingian Empire was more based on on a, on on a Romance land, in spite of the essentially Germanic nature of, of the, especially of, of the Carolingian dynasty as such, in spite of their mixed ancestry. Um, which the French wanted naturally to make their own, right? So emphasizing the Frenchness of it and basically putting aside, trying to put aside the undeniable Germanic ethnicity of the Franks as such, um, which was not really much of a problem per se, uh, beyond, of course, the fact that France had quite some problem with Germany during the 19th century, and vice versa. Uh, it's rather also for the fact that the French had had a revolution, republican regimes, um, and so the relation with the monarchy of the Franks, that basically is where also the Capetians had stemmed from, you know, one or another, was a pretty controversial issue, politically and socially, for for what France had become at that point. So the French really had a, 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 a very torment... I mean, the, the Germans really had it easier, right? They could simply boost right to, to sort of overload uh, the, the the German card because Germany had after all never been conquered by anyone it had remained that one it had been somehow on, on its own character lead mostly they were complex about not having been unified because they stressed that yes like the ancient Germans the Germans would just become a federation right and they lacked their leader and win right that's the thing uh, the French had much more serious issues, especially because of the French Revolution. Similar things had happened even after the the, the English Revolutions, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so there were different peoples and different dynasties that were seen in diametrically opposite way, depending on how you basically, uh, let's say, how you saw the 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 monarchic institution, the role of the parliament, the civil war, what have all the what had come to be, uh, and it was still a game of elites up to a certain point. So, um, consider that still recently, in time, given that as Europeans, I think we deserve to see a a, a true federation, a sort of United States of Europe. Uh, we uh, we are still extremely sensitive about these topics to the point that a project of Euro Euro uh, European manual of history basically was shipwrecked 
um, on over the French or German definition of Charlemagne, which is also some sort of kind of dumb because there wasn't such a proper thing like French or German. When when I use the term German here for defining the ancient Germans, it's fine because after all, we we call the Germans like that, right? Just like we call the Turks uh, in a way. So we 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 use the Roman term to define them. Right, wherever they came from, if they were from Scandinavia or whatever, it's mostly the Germans. That just or nobody says the Germanics, right? Even though it was a much bigger thing, a, a sort of embryo of political territorial German identity was born in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom during the ninth century. Right, mostly a, a historiographical creation in the scriptoria of of the great. Carolingian abbeys in, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. And people living in Germany at the time would mostly consider themselves in very different ways. Uh, uh, from Saxons to Bavarians, etc. Even the Slavs that had yet to be, uh, say, in the modern contemporary territory of Germany, of course, occupied an important amount of land that also had been occupied by the Germans before the migration here, by the way. So you, you understand, especially in Central Europe, how messed up the Eastern Frontier really is, right, in, in true identitary terms. That's also why this would trigger enormous, um, you know, issues during the age of nationalism in the 19th and 20th century, and genocide, etc. Um, so, of course, Charlemagne was not nor French nor German, in a, in a modern national sense, right? He was essentially a Frank, right? And as such, he was a Germanic uh, ruler of, again, in a category that we cannot read nationalistically, but you know, the one of a universal empire based on a natio, in a Latin sense, ruling over peoples of mostly Romance, uh, within the, 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 king, the Frankish kingdom proper, mostly of Romance, uh, ethnicity uh, and that's basically it right uh, and so th there are also other identities such as the religious one and so on and so uh, why a manual would have to to actually point to either the Frenchness or the Germanness in contemporary terms of of this ruler is is quite a quite uh, like uh, an obvious diplomatic gaffe in many ways. And it's not the first time, because there were actual French-German prime ministers me meeting um, in, you know, in the past generations. We're literally starting to, to, to argue amicably about this, who, who's, uh, say, what, what nationality did Charlemagne have, right? Um, still today, for example, in Italian schools, uh, there is this, this idea that I don't know how common that it really is, but the, when looking at the relation between the Franks and the Longbirds, um, this, the, 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 the Carolingian conquest of the peninsula was seen as a sort of French invasion. You see, uh, this is fascinating because wherever there was a sort of French power in maintaining, say, a power concentrated more or less in today's region of France, and we're talking about the north there, essentially from the Frankish legacy, uh, but not necessarily Frankish in, in, as it changed over time to m morph into French, um, together with the switch from Germanic to Roman ethnicity, in, in, as far as the Romance ethnicity, as far as the term at least is concerned. Um, France always thought to take over Italy. Right, it would have been just like the Germans thought that, as long as they had an empire, that after all there was nothing better, something very fragmented politically and very rich economically, um, and not only to just seize. Right, so in part the reason why the Holy Roman Empire was revived, and later you have other, I don't know, the Italian wars, you have Napoleon being crowned by the Pope, and all the, actually by his own hands, but still the papacy needed. Even a, in a, after the French Revolution, and uh, essentially being about to, to, to actually secularize the Holy Roman Empire, dis making it disappear, was still in part a product of this necessity. So something which, to be mm, concrete, still speaks of the sort of northern influence towards the south, conquest, etc. 
Um, but regarding the Frankish invasion of Lombardy, right, when you look at the Italic territory, you realize that uh, there were, for example, still the Byzantines around, um, and that the Carolingians brought with themselves a sort of conf sort of confederal role, right? Charlemagne took up, differently from any other people that had conquered, the title of King of the Longobards, as if he had been a, a Longobard king, right, and not a Frankish king ruling over the, the, the Longobards. I mean, he was in his person, but he was behaving in that sense also in a slightly different way, right? And of course, they were very different, uh, of course, just backgrounds to these countries at that point, right? Consider that the Franks were really more primitive. They were just basically about war, right? They were illiterate. They were just about this military clientele of mounted elite. The Longbirds were much more civilized. They had... Uh, urban culture, they were literate, they, 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 they had a juridical, um, the, the, the dukes had a juridical, uh, you know, activi activity. Um, the Lex Salica of the Franks uh, contained much more backwards uh, sort of norms on, for example, just uh, even just negotiable freedom for for individuals or or on the relation between crime and punishment compared to longobard legislation and i made videos on this but we will come back on it all this uh of course was not uh, could, could not be ignored the consequence of it all in the 19th century um, and in the best of European medievistics, it's characterized by a sort of bipolar syndrome, right? Uh, Georg Weitz, a great and very famous, uh, as I hope you know, German scholar of institutions, presented Europe as being modeled on elements of Germanic culture, uh, deconstruction of new forms of coexistence which practically meant that what had been useful of the Roman past had been preserved and interpreted by the Germanic dominant uh, establishment the French uh, Fustel de Coulange instead um, emphasized in, different way, in a different way the meeting between the Germanic and Latin culture, right? The roots of modern Europe were fundamentally Roman, according to him, and made up uh, by elements that had found in Gaul the meeting point between the Franks and the um, Roman senatorial aristocracy, and so France uh, at that point, a sort of great laboratory to redefine and proposing itself to the future. And both... Um, Weitz and Coulange said essentially intelligent things, right? Because it is true, as we were pointing out in for, for the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, that these were fundamentally Roman-based. I mean, they, they legislated in Latin. They maintained the concept of the palatium. They, the same migration of, of the Germanic peoples had occurred through the hospitalitas, and so through essentially again, replacing the Roman army as it was levied regionally, um, they rem the city remained the center, more or less, right, at least in a, not necessarily a single capital, especially in France, um, but, um, let's say, the, 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 the communications, the sort of, the, the preservation of Latin literature, the continuity, even, of course, in a great deal of uh, uh, ancient um, culture there is something that can't quite be denied and the Germans didn't have any interest whatsoever in destroying Romanity uh, because it was a much more advanced system than their own and whenever they could they would preserve it and work from the same basis and they had we, we do not have any evidence of an ideological um, anti-Romanism uh, if not in the sense that the Germans had won and the Romans had lost, but, you know, when you look at, I don't know, the Longobard kings 
uh, watching the, the the chariot races in in the hippodrome of Milan, just like a Roman emperor would do um, in the late sixth century. Well, at, at, you realize that something even at least not m m mutually exclusive here, <laughs> to say the least. Coulange also is right in pointing out that, uh, from a French perspective mostly, that indeed what had happened in Gaul, I made lots of videos about this, about Clovis, the Merovingians, and why this, say, what happened there was so important. The meeting between the Frankish elite and the Gallo-Roman one, so the, the Germanic chieftains and the Gallo-Roman senators slash bishops, was basically and arguably the most successful uh, political right uh, achievement of the Middle Ages, right? Because it is undeniably from there that what say the center of feudal Europe, right, of chivalry, of say that the sense of, of of nobility, of estate system, of expansion, imperial capacity was eventually that eventually stemmed and was cultivated and sort of expanded and continued. Uh, and so, at that point, the gods had actually maintained the the, the guidance of Europe, uh, and, but they were doing it on a Roman basis that fundamentally was could not quite easily be preserved, also because of the existence of the Byzantine Empire, the reconquest, but also the same Frankish pressure, and so. Ultimately, the latter model managed to to overcome right uh, the, this um, this limit and to eventually hegemonize Europe. Because when you look at the Carolingian Empire, the reabsorption of Romanity, the very strong Christian axis existing, especially between say Italy, Gaul, Anglo-Saxon, um, England. Uh, and the, the evangelization of Central Europe, this gradual... I mean, the Charlemagne managed to unify Germany, which is something that, uh, at least to conquer Germany territorially, entirely maintaining it for good, something that not even the Romans had succeeded in. Of course, it took a lot of time. The Merovingians had made their own share of colonization. They had been Germans themselves, right? But still, again, basing themselves in a Romance land. And then from there, from post-Carolingian Europe, Basically, you have the emanation of what we call Western, of Western Europe, of Western knighthood, of Western, of the, of the the cathedrals of of scholastic. This overwhelmed, the overflowed, right from the Frankish world broadly meant into England, into Sicily, into Spain, into um, Central Europe, uh, and beyond. Right, because that model, as universal in a sense it can be, because it's essentially a feudal one. Right, there were other feudal uh, civilizations in in the world at the time, but this one really had for Europe that was always a much more composite territory culturally than than other countries that are sort of more easily uh, being, for example, based on on a specific basin, right. Uh, uh, Europe has mountains, has different basins, has different climates, has a lot of different things, and yet providing with the sort of basic sort of backbone, especially in again essentially France, Germany, um, uh, most of Italy, right? That from there booming into into an unprecedented. Uh, civilization in the history of mankind that eventually is the same one that has brought the West to the top where it still is, technically in, in a time in which it's declining but because the entire world is actually declining including those who were supposed to be emerging um, powers or whatever so you understand that every country presented things in a in, in, under a light that as biased uh, was was after all correct, right? These historiographical concepts had never quite full been fully expressed. After all, they could have been grasped already. Uh, they were not novelties in absolute terms, but they had to be written down for us to eventually learn them and being presented to us in this fashion. Um, and it's also true these motivation that. F considering the, the heterogeneous of the ends, right? Uh, 
19th century historiography as a whole understood the Middle Ages being a much more complex thing than they had likely realized on a merely chauvinistic basis. Um, they, they realized that the humanists were likely thinking of the Middle Ages in, at least in specifically aimed terms, right? Not necessarily, of course, explaining or answering the same questions that the 19th century historians were, were wondering about. And that there was nothing to be ashamed of in uh, in studying the Middle Ages, in spite of the fact that, yes, these were a period that, as we've seen, did not uh, revive um, a true empire. So that, in spite of this greater blooming, still political unity, the lack of form, right, that in tradition is everything, was a, 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 a real issue, right? Nobody in the Middle Ages truly believed that it was a golden age like it had happened in Augustan times, right? Uh, and the same medievals studied these things and were pretty con concerned with Roman stuff um, as well as their own national history, so you can't argue that say, the Middle Ages was made in the 19th century, but the 19th century was made in a particular way that both impressed us but also spread some other beliefs that um, still accompany us, for for better or for worse. Um, um, it also mitigated the, the full extremism of the fictionalization of the Middle Ages, like something purely romantic or sort of aesthetic. Or here I inserted a lot of pre um, Raphaelite uh, art, which I honestly detest, right? But sometimes, right, is capable of expressing certain archetype which was truly there in the Middle Ages. And you can't quite say that was in fact entirely invented at all, right? Um, we do live in a world in which uh, if you study the Middle Ages at the beginning you want to debunk all this sort of stuff, at the, right? But the more you go on and the more you realize that even the, I don't know, the, the Disney uh, archetypes, Disney cartoons archetypes of the old, the old beautiful Disney cartoons, not um, today's, um, we're stemming from something truly traditional and real that existed at the time. And so it's not wholly invented, and on the contrary, you start to reappreciating what those words really were. Also because, for coming up with these ideas, um, historians had to essentially get the information from the actual sources. I mean, what was happening in the, uh, say, in the 19th century wasn't sort of a uh, just inventing, like, or being politically biased, and again, I always urge people to read what was written in the 19th century because it's much more syncretic, in a way, and sort of spiritual than we are used to believe. Uh, while the 20th century just made a mostly a mockery out of it, saying, oh no, those are the old guys, the idealists, the sort of racialists, or whatever. He said, us materialists and you know structuralists are really better. Yeah, they are really better. In fact, look what what came out of it. And in fact, idealism is coming back, obviously, uh, in these times of crisis, especially. Um, um, history of literature, history of art. Well, these are fields that develop legitimately at the time. Uh, historians sort of debunked many commonplaces that had somehow existed, maybe because one author once said it, and so other people sort of echoed him without actually even checking what sources he was using. For example, uh, the the so-called Jus Primen Octus never quite existed in the way we intended it, right? Also in Braveheart, you see that, you know, the, the Lord arrives and wants to fuck the chick that has just married, has just... Uh, been married in the village, and everybody, yeah, yeah, that, that's the, the the imposition that always existed here. Of course, it wasn't a thing like that. Um, there are also other myths, like, the, for example, the millenaristic fears of the year 1000. They did exist. So these are all things that actually existed, also they use Primenoctus, but they weren't actually existing in the sense that... Uh, in the case of millinerism, literally people even knew what, say, that that, that 
day, you know, th that night actually we're awaiting for actually the end of the world um, at dawn, right? And everybody had synchronized sort of their life in that way, right? There is no evidence of that. But, of course, one must understand what millinerism really was. And the fact it was plenty of theories of that kind. And that, of course, people were awaiting the end of, for the end of the world. But in many ways, we are waiting for that, right? If you look at, uh, say, when, when historians, if there still will be such a thing, uh, centuries, we'll, we'll, we'll look at, I don't know, when people thought that the meme culture had prophesied sort of the end of the world because of the Mayan calendars, etc. We would say, well, these people were stupid and sort of superstitious and whatever. Well, yeah, but it's not that people, act, say most people actually bought it or cared about it or even knew about it for that matter. Um, so generalization work fundamentally just like that. Um, Today, historians fundamentally point to a sort of this, say, you see, structuralism came around, right? Um, it's not much that there is an idealistic coming back, but there is even a complete iconoclasm for which even structuralism is deconstructed. But it's deconstructed, I mean, everything is deconstructed, right? And especially not just structuralism by choice, because that is too mostly done by left leaners. But this kind of idealist views now those are all false. It's just ideologism. It's crypto racism or whatever. It's it's really not, right? Uh, it's just that it's much easier to pretend to say, well, since this thing is ninety nine point nine percent the case and not one hundred percent, let's throw away the entire ninety nine point nine percent because it's not 100%. This is mostly the attitude that exists in academy now, especially in the sort of most dogmatic, Marxistic um, realities. Of course, nothing is, can be perfectly true, but say, let's go by what we have consistently working, and so this is hardly done, right? Um, and uh, one of the concepts is that the Middle Ages never existed as such. I agree I mean, it's it's not that using the term Middle Ages just per se is is useful. It's just, however, a term. It's like Byzantine. I made like three videos on this topic. Um, there is nothing really criminal in using that term as long as you know actually what that means historically and historiographically. Because I think there are very good reasons for calling the Byzantines Byzantines, even if notoriously they were Romans by self-definition. But people are sort of uh, particularly un unsophisticated and they say, no, they just call themselves Romans, so that's how we have to call them. This is identity policy, it's not history. <laughs> you know, you, we, we miscall so many things all the time. The Germans are the Deutsche. Are, are, is, how many people are whining about that? Right, so it's just a sort of narcissistic um, disorder for which you have to point out that you're smarter because you say, oh, well, th that's how they actually call themselves, so you're a bigot if you don't do so. But can you actually explain the complexity of the term Byzantine and historiographically how it came around, why specifically, and, and what the point behind even the judgment really is? Because how does, say, every idiot can say they, they were called Romans, but every idiot definitely doesn't know how to teach Byzantine history or to understand it or to know particularly much about it, right? So, and the greatest experts in Byzantine history are the ones that still call themselves Byzantinists, so I would just stop to that, by the way. Um, there is also a sense that, I don't know, the, the feudal pyramid never existed. Well, the point is that if some idiot came around with the fact that it was a rigid, hierarchical, a system that uh, for which there would have been a, a series of titles that were always corresponding to different levels of power by standard. Of course, that did not exist, but you know, it's a non problem because it's just an approximation someone threw around, and everybody knows that I don't know, uh, the, the Duke of Normandy as King of England was sort of more powerful at some point than, than the same French king. Uh, uh, whose vassal he was as Duke of Normandy. 
Do we have to explain all the time? There was no such thing as the feudal pyramid. Yes, but Wood, Wood did actually believe in the feudal pyramid. Right? Even if as a kid you see that diagram on, on a history book, it's not that you're growing old thinking, well, so that it's literally how it was and there's no escape from that. And I can't think of any other political social reality by definition because I saw that. Right? That's not how human beings are supposed to work, but it's always this sort of attitude saying, ah, oh, there is some evil idiot that believes this, but look at me, I'm smarter, because but in, you discovered that nobody actually believes that, right? So let's concentrate on what actually people do believe, which is pretty serious enough instead, much more than these things, so it's just stupid. Uh, like, you know, we make all this fuss, right? Then a journalist comes out and saying, oh, we're still living in the Middle Ages because, I don't know, somebody has not approved the law on whatever. Right, so you realize that uh, people are hopeless in many ways, but that there is always a chance for them to do better in a way or another. That's why we make history, uh, hopefully, in a decent way. Um, there is also a, an interesting debate, you know, that I make lots of Christian history videos, uh, especially for the Middle Ages, because I think they are really uh, it's really necessary to understand one that um, pointed out there was a debate uh, on this regarding the totalizing idea of a Christian Middle Ages right I sympathize towards the idea of a Christian Middle Ages for the simple reason that the greater spiritual force that brought the greatest powers to, to develop etc was definitely Christian I mean, the Carolingian Empire alone, but just in general, the most developed societies in Europe uh, without any any, any appeal, right? Um, eventually, the entire system Christianized, and together with that, it's civilized, by the way. Uh, and even the process of national nation building in a political sense would happen in that way. So uh, there's not much you can do to deny it. Of course, there weren't uh, just Christians in Europe. At the time, there were naturally lots of pagans at the beginning, but we have to we can't put them on the same place on the same level, right? Because not much because of difference between Christianity and paganism that is also largely invented because people miss it completely at at large the the, the concept that Christianity is just a different stage of the Catholic religion that existed since ever traditionally, um, and just depicted a spiritual stage of humanity. Uh, and that the, the same Christianity was aware of, right? Also in the split of, say, state and church at that point, that people still believe that, I don't know, the split between state and church happened in the last couple of centuries. The, the church has, has never been part of the state since its foundation. That's why it was established, as a matter of fact. Uh, but that's evidently too complicated to explain, apparently. Um, and so th that word that we call pagan fundamentally was not really dying out in terms of you know beliefs that we do not see in Christianity as most people really think right that Christianity made a sort of cultural dis 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 erasing right of what existed before um, most of those things would have been missed anyway because of our oral tradition right and if we do not know much of that because that's literally the only way they transmitted it we we also don't know it about what most christians believed back in the day so that's also something you want to take in consideration uh, but macroscopically so um, and in general also the future of europe was christian and it would be interesting to reflect on this today too because even though religion is sort of on the decline and this is completely expected traditionally prophetically uh, this doesn't mean that Christianity doesn't have a role in European identity and history. There is also another approach for example considering how long did antiquity last right that's quite a so I'm not a huge fan of that even though I'm perfectly convinced that, of course, th there is a massive continuity in, uh, say, antiquity, 
that was erased by mostly in fact also this sort of Germanic idea that after all Rome fell disastrously there was nothing coming out of that as a matter of fact it wasn't quite the case so um, somebody like Guy Bois believes that the ancient world lasts until the 10th century to some degree um, but I don't see say what's the point of simply categorizing putting a term to that I mean antiquity could have lasted depending on whichever parameter there you can see uh, one century more uh, half of a millennium like doesn't um, you know for how we understand history this that this is a key interpretation what's the point of this and not studying in depth what the system was even as a comprehensive view why would this be necessarily to be seen as a continuity of antiquity also by structures like right? there was so much of a right like, say you can think that the ancien regime lasted as a sort of continuity of the middle ages you can understand why because there was no fracture ever in the establishment from antiquity to, to the middle ages in that regard uh, from excuse me, middle ages to even the contemporary era in some ways in spite of the say graduality of of the difference but the um i would say that the main point of course is that by the sixth century is a big crack great, great contraction and i don't see how you can simply frame whatever arrived until the 10th century is antique and the rest middle ages right um i am more um let's say with le goff jacques le goff into as i often say thinking that the Middle Ages lasted until uh, he said that the Industrial Revolution, I would say, 1792 to 1918. Right? I don't think it's the Industrial Revolution as such. This is, of course, a structuralistic idea. It's rather what kind of establishment was in power. Right? There are some historians that, albeit specializing in the Middle Ages, never used the, the adjective medieval, which is quite interesting as well. Um, so how did especially the Latin Germanic thing went on? Um, there is a great um, medievalist, uh, there was at least, uh, Giovanni Tabacco, uh, an Italian. I also mentioned him uh, the other day in the question and answer video about what kind of manual you, you advise in a sort of hybrid between idealism and structuralism in a sort of an eventual way. So Tabacco made very good one. Uh, and he was one of those guys who sort of uh, adopted structuralism to some degree, but having been taught by idealists. And so there are very interesting, there's very interesting storytelling there. Um, and definitely when you read this guy's pages, you realize definitely how, not just how deeply intricated the Middle Ages is, but how deeply intertwined Roman and Germanic cultures really were. So today we tend to give um, sort of equal weight uh, in the scientific community to the Latin and Germanic element and actually binding them, right? Because, uh, say, one could say, well, but maybe one, obviously one had to be more or less important than the other, right? And it's difficult to come to a simple conclusion. I would say that the Latin one was more important, but uh, so if anything, because, again, the, the majority of people, the majority of wealth, and also of, of per capita wealth, was concentrated in Southern Europe. And the greatest powers were tendentially in, in the southern part of Europe, um, even southwestern Europe. And, and that's especially that Western dimension that we've seen as far as the Franks were concerned that makes you reflect on how important Latin Germanic Europe really was. This is not to leave out, I don't know, Byzantine Europe or Slavic Europe. Um, there are some worlds here that are very distant, even when we say when we, they are Latin or they are, um, let's say, uh, Germanic, right? There is a big difference between, say, I don't know, uh, Bavaria and, and Norway or uh, the Mozarabs and I don't know, northeastern Italy. Um, 
There are, again, other elements, such as the Celtic fringe. There, are, there is an Islamic presence uh, as well. There are some non... There are the Ugro Finns with Hungary. There are some peoples that also historically were sort of... Sur- I think about the Basques, right? That were emerging from some sort of even pre-Indo-European background. Um, so everything is more complex than it seems. But there is no doubt that Latin Germanic Europe is the base of what essentially the Western world, as we call it, fundamentally stemmed from. And that is the, also the, the stemming, uh, say, place of what this Westernness ju- already looked like in the Middle Ages. I mean, Poland, for example, was a fully Western country by, in a, uh, say, in, in a broader sense. Of course, it's a Central European country, also Germany, but say uh, it, it can't be fully included that into what we call as Europe at that point because it had been essentially westernized, had been Francicized, we can so say. Um, it's very difficult to do this, to think the same for, I don't know, say, uh, say not difficult necessarily, but say... What about those peoples that at the end of the Middle Ages in Europe ended up uh, subjected by the Ottomans? Right, that's... That's that's a question, right? They were Westerners, if you want them to be. It's still uh, a definition that matters, say, of subjective interpretation. And about all this much we should... uh, definitely expressed if you think about the Reconquista and the fact that for 700 years the Arabs, the, an Islamic rule was present in the Iberian Peninsula at some point not majoritary of course but that's a thing you must consider as well in the relation with the rest for example of post carolingian Europe um, what I would point out and that I always done in my videos is the uniqueness of um, European expansion throughout this time. I truly do not know in relative terms any other at parity of resources and potential weight of such a growth like the one that we observe in especially high medieval Europe. Right? It's it's insane, right? The great medieval civilization is enormous, it's something that we also have difficulties at a point to truly picture entirely because as I explained in that video about European medieval European statistics, the demographics, I mean um sometimes we really have big sort of swing like in terms of extremes of, of estimates. We just understand however it was big, it was huge. Right. Um this had uh, of course a huge consequence itself for the rest of the world even when the system shrank as it happened essentially for the rest of Eurasia and beyond so um, there are surely commonalities with the rest of the world in a sense but it's always uh, the say western uniqueness at some point I remember a couple of years ago somebody asked me what, what is the west Right, and I answered something along the line that fundamentally it's about self-confidence. It's about courage, of, um, you know, affirmative, you know, um, behavior, just action. Right, it, it's about the actualization of the self. So going back to the Germanic issue, say having still a pool of populations were able to revive that sense of strength as it happened throughout the entire Middle Ages through the Latin Germanic meeting and not only I think is one of the single most relevant aspects to define what still westernness remain over time as influenced by structuralism as we are educationally it's difficult for us to see that moral force because um Historiography tended to make it a matter of deterministic, like why there must they decided at some point that idealism was wrong just because, and so they had to explain this as if there was purely a mechanical dynamic into this. 
But the third is that as Europeans we remain dramatically balanced in terms of personal liberty, but also sort of discipline and um, respect towards authority. Again, in a way that is unmatched in the rest of the world. Right, at least the West, of course, that emerged from medieval Europe, also in other continents, uh, presents this. But if you know, if you speak to other, even at the fringes of Europe, like Russia or, and of course beyond, we well, start realizing if you still start having a thorough understanding of you know how distant you get from Western Europe and understanding how people really think, speak, uh, do, like live their lives, you start realizing that there is a sort of huge um, divide, actually, between world civilizations, even the big ones, when people say, well, but India or China, what? Right? Do you realize what they produced in the Middle Ages comparatively? Because the more I studied them in comparison, the least I found something resembling Europe in this sort of perfect combination, or at least better combination for practical purpose. I I think uh, we should start reevaluating that very seriously because it's it's not that this does not exist anymore in relative terms. It's still like that. It's just that we have stopped believing that it is because not because we do not believe in ourselves or we don't like what we have, but because somebody here erased this from history books, which is I think a much more serious problem than it seems, and that's also why I make all these videos. So I think that. Uh, Finding, trying to find this out is particularly relevant, right? And it should be um, reevaluated and appreciated. And if you're, you know, into the same thing, just know that aside from this clumsy three videos that I made to explain a bit all this broader picture, uh, we will hopefully come back on the concept and we will see how the thing really. Um, develops right in for, for our explanation uh, i must confess that i've been through the last month a bit of sort of serious difficulty in my life that doesn't quite depend on me so i'm leaving this uh will probably last for for a while uh and so i'm not very uh you know uplifted uh but i try to in fact make my the most out of these videos because I think that they're basically the the only way at times you can really make the difference in life uh, if they 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 really hit home right and I, I do them also for the sort of therapeutic work um, but Hopefully, we will keep doing them for a long time. For today, uh, however, I stop it here. This is actually the last chunk, uh, just three. Finally, today we managed to conclude. Again, we'll come back unavoidably on these topics. For today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.